presented by Caltech. Hi, my name is Julia Greer, and I make nanoarchitected materials. I'm a professor of material science and mechanics in the Department of Applied Physics and Material Science, which is part of the Engineering and Applied Science Division at Caltech. When I first started my career at Caltech, my main focus was on nanomaterials, studying the properties of materials when they're reduced to the nanometer level. And just for the reference, nanometer is about 100 thousandth of the diameter of your hair. And it turns out that these materials exhibit very different behavior from their bulk counterparts. Historically, many properties of materials have been coupled together. So materials that are very strong are also very heavy, and materials that are very lightweight are generally very weak. This is in part why it's so expensive to fly in an airplane, for example, is because the majority of the operating costs of the airline industry come from propelling nearly a million pound machine through the air, so the, the fuel expenditures are tremendous. And that's because to build a reliable airplane, uh, we have to use strong materials. Materials that are strong have always been also um, coupled to being very heavy. So one of the interesting avenues of research that we're exploring now is what happens when you take effectively a nano ribbon or a nanomaterial that's been extended um, in one dimension and then wrap it around a three-dimensional architecture where the dimensions of the actual architecture are small enough such that your eye can't resolve it. So when you wrap these nanomaterials around such an architecture, you effectively still have a material as opposed to a standalone structure. They have very pretty patterns, if I may say so myself. So they combine some of the artistic features like the Eiffel Tower, for example. Using these nano-architected materials allows us to fabricate materials that are more than 99% air, but without any sacrifice in strength. So it's very, very lightweight, but at the same time, it would be as strong as steel. So let's go take a look at some of these materials down in the lab. Several students are waiting to show them to us. So this is a pretty neat piece of equipment that we have here. We call it the focused ion beam, and it's an electron microscope that allows us to image various nano-sized materials at a pretty high resolution. I'm working on characterizing a new class of alloy. It's actually a new alloy with two different faces, and the instrument helps to fabricate the nanopillars from the different faces present in the alloys. This right here is an example of the octahedron nano lattice that I work with. It's made completely of an acrylic polymer. This particular scanning electron microscope can be used in multiple imaging modes. Because I work with polymeric materials, I need to image them using low vacuum mode, and this requires changing a uh, part of the apparatus. So I'm opening the chamber, and now I'm going to lift up the easy probe needle, which will allow me to better access the tip that I need to change. And now I'm going to change the pole piece tip, which will allow me to use a low vacuum imaging mode. And this is another instrument in the Greer group. This one we call Cementor. It's actually comprised of two different parts of, of two different instruments. One of them is a chamber, much like you saw in the other room, and the other one allows us to perform nanomechanical experiments on structures. So this is an electron microscope that allows, allows us to see the structures that we make and also to deform them. And in the course of deformation, we can observe what happens. In the work that we do, we're, we're branching into new fields of science where we're creating things that nobody's ever studied or discovered before. This is a simple compression experiment on an alumina coated truss structure. The fabrication process takes two or three days and then we put it in this compression testing machine, this cementer, and we take it and compress it to failure. And what I do is I try to look at how tolerant they are to cracks or defects and how that affects their mechanical properties. So the types of structures I make look like this. Um, they're basically just a full lattice, and to look at the fracture toughness, we actually suspend them over um, a trench, and then you see as we push down, the crack actually begins to propagate. And if we zoom in, we see that the crack can propagate throughout the structure until it completely fails. And using this type of test, we determine how resistant um, they are to cracks, to propagation, and we determine the fracture toughness of the material. One of my projects involves cellular solids and making nano scaffolds for uh, synthesizing organs. Specifically, we're working on bones. Here's a kagomi lattice. This structure has been tested for bone growth, so we encode it with the mineral that is present in our bones, 
and then we test this structure with real human cells and the structure performed quite well. We can actually control the geometry and, and try out different geometries and different materials to make these uh, artificial scaffolds that one day hopefully will be implanted um, in human bodies. What we have already demonstrated in our lab is that it is in fact possible to harness the unique properties offered by the nanomaterials. What we're struggling with right now and where I would like to see this research go is being able to scale them up to the dimensions that would be useful for practical applications. So the very next um, steps that we're aggressively pursuing right now is developing a technology to construct a larger macro material out of them. And this would lead us to the development of materials that contain maybe 99.9% .9 air and at the same time retain um, the strength of steel.